goodness. What's happening? <laughs> Where, what just happened? You took my glasses. See? Oh, here we go. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Stephanie Rollins Blake took your glasses. Ah! Oh, petty. All right. Petty. All right. <laughs> <laughs> This is RadioFire.com. You're Shirley Dominique in here. And uh, I have some special guests representing the very, very argumentative gang. Mm. I see BC. Oh, oh, they are here. <laughs> two, two of the representatives here. Uh, metal detectors are not working, but uh, I still feel safe. I still feel safe. Ladies, please introduce yourselves. <laughs> See? I'm Silence. Crystal. I'm Nika or Kia. D- you, wow. Did that just happen? <laughs> I have not heard you refer <laughs> to yourself <laughs> with that. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Such a troublemaker. What? Come on, come on. What? What? I'm Crystal. She said she was Crystal. I heard that. And I said, I'm Nika or Kia. Or Kia. Or, okay. yes. All right. So, Crystal. Yes. And Nika or Kia. All right. So, you know, two, <laughs> two Baltimoreans. And we're going to talk about Baltimore because Baltimore is, in your opinion, is it messed up? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it better than it's ever been or worse or what? Baltimore is an awesome city with a lot of potential. Yes. I agree. I would say... <laughs> It's in a it's in a transition period, and the transition is between whether we are going to go from a chocolate city to a white chocolate city in short order. Hmm. What? What do you, you mean? mean? What? What do you mean? I mean, are, is the city going to be gentrified, <laughs> and is that gentrification, quote unquote, going to cause the people, primarily black, who have been living in the city? Um, for generations to be displaced from their homes by the new development and the newcomers to the city. So when I say gentrification, I'm talking about the process by which you um, have revitalization, quote unquote, efforts combined with the displacement of a population that already was um, living in a place or already living in community. Yeah. Yeah. And um, this is not something that's unique to Baltimore, obviously. it's not. Uh, this is happening in, uh, you know, communities throughout the country. Uh, can the can it happen without gentrification? You can have revitalization absolutely without gentrification, but gentrification typically means that the people who are indigenous or the people who are already living there are displaced. Right. Um, they're displaced in, in a number of ways. For example, if you look at um, the governor's core program, which is whole block demolition of vacant properties. Typically what happens is, let's say there's eight properties on the block and all but one of them is vacant. They will move um, using various funding sources that one person on the block elsewhere, but that elsewhere isn't necessarily temporarily, which means that that person is moved and they don't necessarily aren't, Either they can't afford to come back when the neighborhood has been revitalized or they simply are in position for other reasons to come back into the neighborhood. So you are moving people out of their homes and putting them elsewhere for the benefit of this new gentry class or this new business class or or whatever um, whomever comes in afterwards. So that's an example of how gentrification um, takes place. It takes place with displacement. Now, absolutely, you can develop um, community benefit um, community benefits agreements or public-private partnerships that do not um, displace people but do revitalize, do bring investment, do bring new buildings, new institutions, new economic opportunities into communities. So, yes, you can have right revitalization without um, gentrification. Uh, I think it's important to talk about the culture that leads to blight and the culture that leads to a situation where gentrification is possible, Good point. where they leave the communities in disrepair. The owners of those homes are not held accountable for the disrepair of those homes. Homes have been boarded up for 20 years, 15 years, and just left 
Um, and no one is held accountable for that, but the residents of that community are blamed for that when they're not the homeowners. And so I think that blight doesn't happen in a vacuum. So, so you're, you're speaking more about homes that are owned by who then? Whomever. The, the people I know and live around aren't homeowners. Right. We're right. renters. So one can assume that the homeowners are of a different demographic, right? And so in those cases... The culture of slum landlord comes into play because you can see homes that are not that are vacant in the county, but they're not boarded up. The grass is still cut. Most things, for the most part, still look the same on that block. However, in the city, those homeowners are allowed to just leave the houses till the roof caves in until some homeless person dies inside of it, and then they want to come and sweep up. So, the whole culture of gentrification is not something that just comes by happenstance. There is an actual plan that may have started 20 years ago, that may have started 50 years ago, where they said these areas, redline these areas, we're going to leave those and, and not care for them however the municipality is supposed to care for them. And so that once they fall into disrepair, we can swoop in, replace the residents in, in some clandestine effort to put them in a better area instead of maintaining the areas that they already live in, instead of maintaining the historical uh, architecture of the city in, in more neighborhoods than the few they choose to, to, to piecemeal. Um, because with gentrification comes new development and the city kind of loses its look and it loses its feel which is not necessarily a bad thing. However, in the history of America, Baltimore is a historic city. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there are some things that we may not want to lose to renovation or to rebuild or revitalization. So, for example, you have the alley streets. Baltimore is one of the few cities with alley streets. And if you know the history of Baltimore, that you know that who lived on those alley streets primarily were African Americans. So when you come through and you have a plan that's going to get rid of all of the alley streets to mm -hmm. either um, expand the, the yards or expand green space, which you have as a loss of black history, um, without people even thinking maybe intentionally or purposely about how that destroys the fabric of the community, it destroys the culture in the community, and potentially there's a lot of history. Sometimes when you go in these buildings, you find documents, you find furniture, you find other relics. And if people go in without a plan, without understanding the historical context of those alley streets, and you just level it, you don't even go to check. Mm -hmm. There's something that could really, a value that could be certainly lost when, when you do that. Absolutely. That's that's just very true. Um, and before, before we, I, I want to work backwards. Okay. And... Um, what is the reason, do you think, for, no, let me say this another way. Do you think that we hold any responsibility for the neighborhoods being targeted? If you mean, if, you, if by we you mean black people, absolutely. Yeah. We always um, have to be responsible for our communities. And so one of the things that is talked a lot about is white flight. And white flight is the whole concept that post-civil rights, you had white families um, flee the city because um, segre um, segregation had been shot down in housing. And so folks didn't want to leave. Um, some white folks didn't want to live with black folks. But the second thing, and more importantly, when it comes to our own accountability, following the um, white flight was this thing that I called a black following. And that black following was when middle class and uh, working class black families that were able to then follow white folks into the suburbs in the 70s and into the 80s did so. And what they left behind was a population, a much smaller black population. They left behind many people who were not um, necessarily um, able to maintain properties or maintain communities. Either they didn't have the economic um, know-it-all or the political know-it-all. And so we do bear a big responsibility for the condition um, that ba black Baltimore finds itself in, um, which is one of the reasons why 16 years ago, when I could have decided to live in Howard County, when I could have decided to move to Montgomery County, I chose very specifically and very intentionally to move to Baltimore City because it's our responsibility to make sure there's some continuity in our community. It doesn't, racism doesn't excuse um, 
our responsibility. It actually calls us to be even more accountable to each other in community to make sure that our folks who may not have the, the know-it-all, may not have the access, may not have the ingenuity, are still cared for properly and not left um, to live in a city with 15,000 vacant properties. Also, to answer your question, of course, we are responsible for whatever we have personally done, but I still say it goes back to the owners of these properties. <coughs> if you live in a property, most leases say I come in for inspection every six months, once a year, and I assess the property and I make changes, repair, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. They literally leave these properties and they shuffle in one family from the next, one eviction to the next, somebody's stuff is on the curb and whatever, and they never do the necessary repairs. So you're saying something that happens. It's not like a slum. It's, slum it's slumming. So, of course, the person who threw the trash in the yard is responsible for throwing the trash in the yard. But the homeowner who is responsible for maintaining that property is responsible for making sure the tenants obey whatever the guidelines of a lease are. And I've never seen a lease that says it's okay to throw trash all over the yard. Cool. So both, both parties are at fault. And if you have a tenant of any demographic who is not caring for the property then that tenant should be evicted but they don't do that they just continue to collect rent from the people and just let the houses go into disrepair and so then we had this other issue we have a lot of properties in our families that for a number of reasons we have not been able to keep in good condition so you have big mama or pop pop living in a house mm -hmm. that they struggle um and work very hard often paying too much in order to purchase and as they age their um, children and grandchildren have moved on to other places and aren't participating in the process of keeping that property up yes. not understanding the power of generational um, wealth transfer that happens primarily in, in the U.S. It happens primarily um, through the transfer of property at the at the death of, of a family member. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of properties that we have um, lost due to water bills, mm -hmm. due to tax, tax sales, mm -hmm. and due to tangled titles, which are left when people die without a will, uh, which is something that unfortunately death and, and preparing for death is something that our folks seem to struggle to want to talk about. But when we don't, we um, leave ourselves and our families open to loss, you know, losses via not being able to transfer the wealth, but also that can come between sisters and brothers when they're sitting up fighting over Definitely. what's going to happen with Big, with Big Mama's house. Right. The... Uh so, so how do we address the, uh, I don't want to say inability, but I, I want to, how do we address the fact that a lot of us just, the pride is just not there? So whether, let me say it this way, the pride to keep the community clean. You know, you ever sit in your car and you see people drive and they're throwing trash out the window or people in the corner and they're just throw stuff down, and this just accumulates and accumulates. And these are kids, young young people I'm talking about, or older people. But if we are moved to Baltimore County, then it just it happens Baltimore County. You just turn Baltimore County to what they were relocated from in Baltimore City. You know what I'm saying? Well, part of How do we address that part? We have to address... Um, we have to address the real, the very real fact that black people in the US, black people in the Caribbean, black people in Latin America, black people in Africa, black people anywhere on the planet are suffering from low self-esteem. We suffer from the fact that for the last 500 years there has been an all out assault on black people. It's been an all out war on black people. We've called it, they've called it all kinds of different things. They called it colonialism. They've called it uh, manifest destiny. They've called it, um, you know, the, the Christian ethic, we are, we are Christianizing or bringing God to the savages. They've called it the war on poverty. They've called it the war on drugs. But the fact of the matter is it's been a war on white, uh, a war on black people at the hands of people that we, that we know as today as white. And what it has done is made us not love ourselves, not have pride in ourselves, devalue ourselves. So 
any of the things, the behaviors that you see that we would call maladaptive in our community, such as throwing trash or, or um, not being able to get along with one's family members or not taking one's education seriously. All of those things are a result of the self-esteem issue that we have. And so you ask what we can do to um, deal with that. So we have to very intentionally um, work to, one, understand how we got here, how we got to this place, um, and understand that the same way we've been demoralized, we can recapture that the, that part of ourself that's been lost. So simply, if you see a young person throwing trash in the street, you, you address that. Hey, don't throw trash in the street. This is your neighborhood. This is where you live. Don't, don't, don't trash it. And so we have this other issue of being afraid of our youth. That's a problem. We can't afford to be afraid of our children. Because if there's something wrong, wrong with our children, that's an indictment on us. That's an indictment on our, on our parents. That's an indictment on our grandparents. We have to take responsibility for teaching them and teaching and, learn, and relearning ourselves in spite of um, our experience. So developing a sense of self and the sense of self for African people black people, whatever you want to call us, Negro, whatever it is, that sense of self is um, born out of the community's sense of well-being, sense of self, sense of determination. So we have to very, as our name um, indicates, we have to very intentionally build community as a collective. And that means we have to talk to each other. We have to um, work together. We have to spend our money in our communities before we spend it elsewhere, we have to make some very real sacrifices in order to restore the soul of ourselves. Um, also, I think um, holding the individual accountable is very important. However, we live in a municipality. We're not on some desert island where we're fending for ourselves. And so the responsibility mm -hmm. of the municipality is to maintain the city. So especially with the jobless rate, there can be trash collection and cleanup throughout this city. And I just remember my grandma would always say, poor don't mean dirty. So there's That's absolutely no reason that this city has to look the way it looks. There just isn't. No matter how many people throw trash out the window. If you've been to other, if you've been to other cities, major cities, they're not as <laughs> much trash <laughs> as there is here. Yeah. So it's, it's a two two-pronged solution, but we can't keep releasing the municipality from their responsibility Absolutely. to maintain us. We pay taxes. Um, even the renters pay taxes because we pay that owner who pays his taxes. And so there are things that can be done. I mean, I think this current mayor switched the trash day from two days to one, and, you know, the alleys were full of trash and the rats was There are a lot fun. of alleys that are, that are full of trash. Exactly, and that's the one thing where you should not be cutting the budget trash <laughs> removal in Baltimore City. Especially with 15,000 vacant properties. And the, right. the other, to Crystal's point about holding municipalities accountable, like we have to be real clear. One, people do pay taxes. But two, part of the can, reason why certain portions of the city look like war zones is because they were strategically disinvested right. in by people in government. There was choi choices were made. So instead of um, focusing on developing Sandtown, Winchester, or developing Park Heights. Money was funneled, in, funneled, fun, funneled. funneled huh? <laughs> into Canton, into Harbor East, into um, Federal Hill. Money is now going to be funded, um, funneled Port into Port Covington. And yes, it's good, great. Under Armour's blowing up. That's nice. Maybe it'll bring some jobs. But let's be real honest. Mm -hmm. Are the jobs that it's going to bring for two people in our community outside of the $11 an hour, I think it is, jobs that they have in a warehouse. And as the city is redeveloped, the people who work those warehouse jobs won't even be able to live in the same city because as the development happens, the price of um, rent is going to skyrocket. So we have to be very careful um, to make sure that we are holding um, municipalities and city workers um, responsible. For example, I spent the better part um, of the summer documenting the demolition, the conditions of, of city demolitions. 
you tearing down buildings that have all sorts of toxins and everything in there, and you won't even put up a gate. I had I'm to. Glad, I'm glad you brought that up. I had to literally fight these people mm -hmm. to have them put up a gate to protect our children from holes in the ground. Yet the city, our our municipal workers, people who our tax dollars pay, will, are, are currently refusing to hold the contractors to the terms and conditions of the contracts that they sign. So yeah, I mean it's it's uh, um it's politics. It's it's tricky. Uh, what if you if you could say like five things that need to happen when you say holding holding them accountable, uh, holding the government accountable. So, How do you do that? So I'm gonna take I'm gonna Go take the, the personal account, our community stuff, and you can take the municipal stuff. Mm -hmm. So my five things would be number one, we need to ensure that we are caring properly and appropriately for our children and our elders. That's number one. Um, number two, in doing so, the first thing we have to really do, switch it around, is to understand ourselves. So there's a lot of study that we need to be doing. Um, Changa and I jokingly put out a list of 52 books for Ray Lewis to read when he was talking out the side of his mm. head, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. We really need to be about the business of studying, and that's going to mean books like um, Dr. Joy DeGruy's Post Traumatic um, Slave Syndrome, even though our trauma isn't post. It's going to uh, mean reading books like Living in the Village by Ryan Mack, which teaches us about economic empowerment. So we're going to have to study. So that's one and two. Um, the third thing is we have to be real clear and intentional in our development and maintenance of our interpersonal relationships. So um, children to parents, siblings, um, lovers, whomever, um, even in our business relationships, because that leads into number four. We must start circulating money inside of our business. I implore us. I'm not telling people. I used to say cancel Christmas, but nobody's trying to hear that. So, so <laughs> what I am, what I'm saying, um, what I'm saying now is let's make this Christmas the first year where black people spend 80% or more of their 100% <laughs> their um, holiday shopping funds inside of our community. There are all kinds of makers and vendors of products that we can give yes, our money products to and services. products and ser uh, products and services mm -hmm. right above this studio right here is um glow wellness the sister mm -hmm. does wonderful um, massages and um she's an esthetician she does wonderful skincare but she also makes her own skincare line mm -hmm. moisturizer all of that kind of stuff so why would we give jergens a dime when we could give that money to, to Constance. I mean, so um, that piece is in, in important. And then the last piece I'm going to say is we really um, have to restore um, the power of, and I, when I say the black church, I'm using that term loosely to mean any black spiritual organizations. So there was a time in this country where if you... Um, if black people were suffering for any reason, the black church or the nation of Islam or whomever stood in the gap and fought on the front lines in terms of getting civil rights or fought um, on the front lines of helping us regain our righteous mind, we have to make sure that our black churches, our black uh our mosques, our synagogues, whatever kind of our, our elays, our um, all of our worship houses and our organizations. So that means our Greek letter organizations who do wonderful work. Shout out to my to my sorors, do wonderful work. But we need to be doing we need to be doing more of that. What is the NAACP doing? I'm not trying to be funny. What are they doing? What were you supposed to say? No shade. Nope. No. No. See, no, I don't no. even play them games. <laughs> okay. So what is the NAACP doing? You know, the Urban League does work. What are they doing? We need to be doing more. But that also goes to a position of funding. Who is funding these organizations? And then who is holding pastors accountable for what is being done with our ties? I'm sorry. I don't care how good your pastor give the word, there is no reason for your pastor to be in a Maybach and Miss Mabel is eating cat food 
or losing her house to tax sale or has her roof falling down. That is not acceptable. Our institutions must be about the business of serving us. So that's all my five personal ones. I'm totally like it's my turn. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, hmm. Hmm. so the municipality <laughs> has to, has the one come into a position of full disclosure. We have so many council meetings and community meetings and neighborhood meetings to pacify the residents when really decisions have already been made, bought, paid for, and receipts already done on them. But they say, oh, let's hold a meeting and let them speak, let them speak their piece. And then <laughs> nothing changes. So we need tangible changes made. We need to have, we need to empower our uh, city council members and the, the more hands-on and grassroots members of our government so that when they go to the higher ups, they are empowered. They're not just one man with a picket sign. You know, a lot of us don't know our actual uh, council member. The, you know, we may know Elijah Cummins, but he's in DC, minding his DC business. We need to know who is in our actual neighborhoods and who we need to hold accountable because they too fall into the, the cycle of politics where you just say something, you get elected and you show up at events and then that's kind of over. Um, the second thing is the allocation of funding in this city is horrible, 100% horrible. So when, when the mayor uh, allocates money to restore Port Covington, what, uh, what are the stipulations of that money? To our knowledge, he's just giving the money to develop it and developing it is enough. But no, it's actually not enough. And had she consulted with the citizens of that area of Cherry Hill and Westport and Brooklyn, you know, it would have, you know, been able to hold him to more of a standard besides develop it. Because development in itself is really not doing anything for the community besides making it look better. But the, if the actual people are still hungry and suffering and 90% of them are still on social services and the businesses that come, like Under Armour, um, hire people, but hire them through temp agencies. So if you work through a temp agency, A, you don't get all of your wages, Benefits. and B, you never qualify for medical health insurance or anything. Right. And so it's it's a cop-out. Oh, we employ people, but at the drop of a hat, you know, you can let them go. And when you work for a temp agency, you don't get unemployment from that. And so it's kind of a false sense of employment. And then the people you do employ are only... Amazon too, only this one level. All of the higher ups, all of the salaried people, all of the um, the people with tenure in those businesses are either they're definitely not black, and then they're not from our community. I remember a time when a lot of our people in our community worked down Spurls Point. A lot of the men in, in the neighborhood I grew up with worked down Spurls Point. No, it wasn't the greatest work ever understood, but they made enough of a wage they could provide for their families, have home ownership. And continue to, you know, this city could continue to, to thrive. And so once Spurs Point closed down, you saw a decline in home ownership and, you know, different types of trickle effects. So if they're going to redevelop Port Covington, I just don't see what, rip, what positive ripple effect it's going to have for the city. So the municipality needs to be held accountable also by um, making their word their bond. Our schools are horrible. Maybe 2% of them are actually good schools that we are happy to send our children to. The other 98%, we just kind of got to send them there because that's what the city has to offer, or we don't have anything to compare it to. Um, well, we know the schools closed because no air conditioning and, and those kind of things, and they're not technologically up to date. So to keep assuming that Baltimore is a poor city, is a falsehood. Baltimore is not a poor city by any stretch of imagination. Um, so we have the money. It's just how the funds are being allocated. And because we come in late after the bus already took off and complain, basically, um, it, it, you know, not a lot gets done. And so holding those people accountable, um, making sure our, <laughs> our mayor is looking out for our interests and not looking out for the interests of our governor and his agenda um, are all things that we can do to uh, fix it. To hold, to hold <laughs> the municipality Yes, to hold the municipality accountable, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, agree with, I agree with that. Uh, let's talk a little bit before we go. Let's talk a little bit about 
I C B C. Yeah. What's up? What, Remember uh, my our gang? What, what, what was we? <laughs> we were a destructive a, gang. A, I didn't say argumentative. Yes. Argumentative gang. Okay. Gang. Okay. So y'all proved me wrong. Sound like a Sun Paper article. <laughs> Not what I was going for. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, about what y'all do. Okay, so really, ICBC is a collection um, of families. Uh, we started initially with three families, and now we are about 10 families strong. And what our overall aim is, is to develop co-housing in Baltimore. And what co-housing is, is when a group of people decide, hey, I want to be your neighbor. I want to live next to you. I want to cultivate community and and create a vibrant neighborhood with you and you and you. And so we have set about uh, that mission. We uh, have done a number of efforts, everything from raising money for Gilmore Elementary School um, Library, which was a library without books uh, <laughs> last year around this time. We also have um, donated books and money to Collington Square Elementary School. Uh, we made an attempt to, there's a store around the corner called um, Sankofa Store. We made an attempt. They had a raffle. They were going to raffle off uh, the store to take so that the um, owner could return home to Ghana. And we would have, if the um, contest had gone forward, we would have had an opportunity to take over the store in terms of running it, owning it, and, and um, running it. So we've done that. We are currently also running an 100 new accounts in 100 days initiative with the Harbor Bank of Maryland. Because one of the things that we have to be very clear about is we need to support those institutions that supported us. And when it was difficult to get loans in this city to start businesses, when it was difficult to get loans because they were redlining in terms of um, housing, you had black banks and other black lending institutions standing in the gap. And so if we are um, going to go forward with um, making sure that our money matters, we need to be using and holding accountable and owning black um, financial institutions. So we are doing that. So if you don't have an account already with Har Harbor Bank of Maryland, please go open an account. They have a variety of accounts, um, savings accounts, investment accounts. Just let them know that you're with ICBC. And there are some additional perks that you'll receive. We're uh, working on a financial workshop, on budgeting, and a number of different uh, uh, other different financial topics. Uh, but the project that we are very excited about right now is our Sunday Sunday dinner house project. Hey. So we get together every Sunday and we eat together. We talk uh about politics, about family, about relationships, about anything that is impacting us. We plan for the future. We've had a um, insurance agent come in and work so that we can start working on our individual and group estate plans. So um, the Sunday Dinner House Project, we are trying to raise $20,000 to purchase a property in either Druid Heights, uh, Sandtown, Harlem Park, and this space would become an intimate art, social, and spiritual space that the community could use. So it won't just be for the use of ICBC for Sunday dinners, but it also will serve as a place where um, if for some reason we had you know, a black luminary coming from out of town and we needed to put them up somewhere so that um, they could give their speech. We could um, provide space for them. If we had someone who wanted to have a small intimate um, gathering for women or for men, they could use the space. We could um, use it for meeting space. Um, we have a lot of people in Baltimore, whether folks know it or not, that practice traditional African religions. And so there's often a need for space to, to do ritual. So we, these are things that the space would be used for for community. And so we have raised roughly, we had raised roughly among the, the 10 families um, $4,500. And we are now trying to raise the remainder on GoFundMe. So check us out. It's Intentional Community Building Collective and it's Sunday Dinner House is the project on um, GoFundMe. And so, you know, that's kind of what where we are, what we're doing. She's uh, where we are and what we're doing and why it is important that um, we all we, we continue to work together and be intentional in um, 
in developing or redeveloping a sense of community because we come from people, like I said before, whose whose sense of self is rooted in the sense of community. And so if we're going to get back to our pre-enslavement um, period greatness, if we are to take all of the greatness that our in in ingenuity and creativity of our ancestors and elders thus far forward um, so that we can have an a Afro future, then we have to really be intentional in the development of our community. Um, and the other part of that, to the to the uh, Harbor Bank piece, a lot of people feel like, oh, you know, I'm comfortable with the bank I'm at. Um, you know, it's a credit union. You know, they get all of, you know. They do. They, they like their credit union. Right. Light bulb over the head. You can have more than one bank account. Ta-da. So you can still <laughs> you can still open a harbor bank account. You can use it for savings, you can use it for your vacation money, you can use it for, for whatever. Your holiday, you can use it for your holiday savings right. account, because anything. The more money the bank has, the more lending power they have. Absolutely. And so Very when important. you complain like, oh, I went to Harbor Bank and they denied me, well, Harbor Bank doesn't have as much money as the bigger lenders to give you because they don't have as many accounts. Right. Ta da. Very true. Very true. Very true. Well you mean we said. get through this whole conversation and you ain't disagree with us one time? I mean, if it was Won't something she could, do it? Won't she do it? Look, look at God. If something I could disagree with y'all about. She do it? Look at God. Um, okay, okay. God. Before, before we go, uh, is Nicki Minaj the best stuff. rapper ever or what? Oh. Nicki Minaj. I was going to say no. Nicki Minaj is an awesome The best female rap I met. No, oh, Lauren Hill. Go ahead with that. Lauren best. Hill. Oh, no, no. Lauren Hill. No. You're Lauren telling me, Hill? Are you, wait, wait. You're telling me that Nicki Minaj is better than Lauren Hill? Yes. Nicki Pause. Minaj, Shut it down. Yeah. Close the door. Turn off yes. the lights. Nicki Minaj is better than Lauren Hill. <laughs> no, sir. Mm -mm. No. Yes. False. False. Yes. No. False. No, based on what? Based on. Facts. You, everything based on this education. <laughs> everything is based. You basing everything Listen, on one facts, freaking B. album. Yeah. She made one album in twenty years. Can't make another album. She's not the best. Okay. Well, y'all love Al Pacino the off best? of one movie. Ooh. Patty. Patty. Al Pacino. I'm not. Off, off of Scarface. Not like. My, no, he's done more than that. But <laughs> good movies. He ain't the best. How many good movies? The Godfather was good. Okay. Great. Two. Two. <laughs> Al Pacino is not, is not the best of stick. Okay. Lauren Hill, uh, come on. Lauren give me somebody a better, better lyricist. Give me somebody better. There is no better female MC than Lauren. Lauren, one album makes you no great. One album, one. In that one album. One? Well, then if one album makes you no great, then how can Biggie, who only did two albums, hmm. be among the greatest Hmm. Inquiring minds. Women. Okay, I can answer I'm just that. Saying, I'm I can just answer saying. that. First of all, I don't put Biggie in my top five. Right, risk, okay, <laughs> he's Nas, in the top Nas, ten. Nas, Nas, Nas. But Nas, my birthday twin. But Jay Z would be is is number one on, on that list. Okay. Awkward. All right. So he is. <laughs> Jay Z he cool is. Jay Z, you know. but he's no Nas. Keys, keys. Nas is Nas is pretty cool. Nas is pretty cool. He keeps his fade tight. You can't be free. Till you on your own, you can't be big. I'm just saying. I roll with Jay, but he ain't Nas. Please yeah. watch the Get Down. Wait a minute, real quick. Yeah. Please watch the Get Down. That's good. That's Definitely. important. Recommend Please that. watch uh, 13th on Netflix. Recommend and that. Luke Cage. Yes, and watch Luke Cage and Queen Sugar and Insecure and um, Underground. And <laughs> <laughs> Black TV is on fire Black right TV. now. And Yeah, let's watch Black. it and okay, talk, to, talk to your people. I'm up against, I'm up against the clock. I hmm. do, I hmm. do. <laughs> have one last thing for you. Can we get serious for a minute? Serious. Why did and, and I need a short version. Hmm. Why did he, short version? he don't know Medea? Oh Jesus! Outsell uh, Birth of a Nation. Uh, <sighs> the short and version. Go. Medea outsold Birth of a Nation because Massa told you to be mad at Nate mm. Parker because of a, a crime that he was acquitted for. Mm. Medea also birth to a nation because Massa told you don't worry about your history. You got freedom now, nigga. <laughs> Come thing. Medea also birth of a nation because niggas just rather be entertained and educated. Medea also birth of a I like nation. That. Oh. I like any that. Was good. You need that was good. What you got? I mean, I'ma just give a little I'ma just give a little nuance. Just give me one second. I know you're up against the clock, but let me just give this this little nuance. Um we have to be very careful not to appear like we are upholding um, 
-hmm. sexual assault, rape, or anything that erodes the agency or consent of another human being. We do understand that there's been a long history in America of white women falsely um, accusing black men of rape. However, comma, but the, the people who have experienced the most sexual violence mm -hmm. in this land to date have been black, black women. women and black men. We do not talk about the sexual violence experienced by black men from the enslavement period to today via prison culture. So let's be very clear that we never, ever, ever uphold rape culture. This is the thing that one of the things we absolutely must destroy in order to have healthy community. We cannot continue to imitate our oppressor in our relationships to each other. Period. The end. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Again, y'all represent ICBC. That's right. ICBC. You can check us on Facebook. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, we on Facebook, Intentional Community Building Collective, and on GoFundMe. You can look up Sunday um, Dinner House or ICBC, and we'll we'll come up. Or you could friend. Oh, I don't know if you want to friend me on Facebook. I'm ratchet, but um, Nika Namdi, <laughs> Nika Namdi, <laughs> um, or Latoya Huff on Facebook. Okay, there, there you have it. I'm at the Diamond K Show everywhere <laughs> that mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. people are looking for me. My black. Planet page is He's gone. gone. I hope so. Good, bro. <laughs> Let doing? it go. All right. So, uh, when are y'all coming back so so we can chop it up again? <laughs> you tell you tell can, us. Can, can we come back uh, after? Um, Here we go. The uh, election. Can, can, oh, can we, can oh. We I think back? we need oh. to do a pre-election. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I love that. I can I give you. A, I can give you. The, I can give you a pre-election right now. I would now. love that. Don't matter who is forty-five. We still gonna be black. <laughs> Okay. We still gonna be alive. Are you voting? If we smart, we gonna thrive. Yes, I'm Sheila voting. Dixon. I only Sheila vote Dixon, in Sheila um Dixon. in respect of those who gave their life because they thought that we deserved the right to vote. I only vote because they were on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. I only vote because they shot Mega Evers in his driveway. I only vote because they shot Malcolm X. I only vote because they shot Martin Luther King. I only vote for um. My, the founders of Delta Sigma Theta who walked in a women's suffrage parade as their first official act, but white women pushed them to the back, threw bananas and water on them. Those are the people I vote for. I don't vote because I think my vote matters. Um, I, I don't. <laughs> Sorry. But we can, we can talk about this more on the next time. Yes, please. Let's do that. All right. All right. So thank, <laughs> thank you ladies very much for a very, very... Uh, Y'all agree with everything I said, so that. Ah, <laughs> boom. <laughs>